everyone is a star child made of stardust and the infinite potential of the universe. This extraordinary fearless something in each of us clamors for freedom from the bonds of fear, conformity, and an ordinary life. Welcome to Dr. Durr's Living in the Sweet Spot, where practical tools and solutions from the intersection of mind-body medicine, science, and spiritual well-being awaken and empower you to live out your infinite potential, to live life in the sweet spot. Welcome to Dr. Durr's Living in the Sweet Spot. This is the premier show where we educate you about the essential role of brain health to create fulfillment and the greatest demonstration of your purpose and potential. My guests and I have thought-provoking and inspiring conversations that offer you practical tools and solutions from the intersection of mind-body medicine, science, and spiritual well-being to live out your infinite potential, to live life in the sweet spot. So today I'm going to be having a conversation with Dr. Donna Perry. And Dr. Donna Perry is a board certified obstetrician and gynecologist. She is a uh, medical director for the for Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Illinois. And she has more than 30 years of experience, including 16 years of working in her own private practice in the Chicago area. Again, she has been the medical director for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois since 2016. Dr. Perry believes strongly that women's health begins with girls' health and understands the value of family and how teaching healthy habits along with the importance of preventive care can create a happier, healthy life for generations to come. So Dr. Perry is joining me today so that we can discuss the importance of doulas in helping maternal health and, and, and illness. In, order, in other words, in order to help women have better outcomes during their pregnancy and um, after delivery. So Dr. Perry, I'm so excited to have this conversation with you today and, and welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm very excited about participating in today's program. And I want to get that information out there to the public because, you know, our community just doesn't know how important um, uh, support is during pregnancy and, and how important postpartum care and communication with somebody who knows the warning signals when there's a problem. So I'm, I'm great to get that information out. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, you know what? It, as you well know, this is uh, something that's actually really a longstanding issue for women. And uh, in, actually, initially, even though my specialty is child adolescent and adult psychiatry, I actually, my decision to become a physician was actually because I wanted to become an OB-GYN. Now, this, this, is when, this is when I was in junior high school, mind you. And then when I got into doing the rotations, um, I changed my mind and went to psychiatry instead. But the fact remains is I still love OB. So, and you know, and and so the risk of women having having either either illness or complications or actually dying from childbirth, again, is one that's just been longstanding. And I know, you know what, interestingly enough, I think that some of the, the shows that we're seeing on TV, like say games of Game of Thrones and those kind of shows that they really show just potentially how deadly childbirth is for women. I mean, especially back then, but again, there's this persistence. So, so, so why don't you tell us about what that looks like for, for women these days? Well, I can, I can go back um, a little bit in history. You know, it used to be, you know, now the women outnumber men. And um, this is because before the turn of the century, well, I guess before 1900, there were no antibiotics used. So after the, the use of antibiotics, uh, the, the death rate of women uh, decreased dramatically. 
So um, that helped um, in recent in recent history. But and, and overall, washing your hands, right? Right. Uh, how about hands. how about washing your hands? That that helps a lot, even to this day. People kind of forget that's very important. Hand washing, but antibiotics and aseptic uh, te techniques and things like that help uh, women survive. So even though these things have uh, improved through the years. Uh, for some reason, the United States has lagged behind many um, um, well-developed or the richer, the wealthier countries like Germany, France, Spain, um, the Netherlands, things, places like that, as far as um, maternal death rates. And it's, it's downright embarrassing um, how we lag. We spend so much money um, on, on health, but we, we lag uh, when it comes to um, maternal deaths. And that's it's downright, I said downright embarrassing. So, um, you know, so, we so, have- so, so, doc, so Dr. Perry, let me ask you this, because of course, when you say that, that we lag behind and that given the amount of money that we spend, where, where, is the, where is the disconnect? In other words, why is it that we are spending so much money, but are lagging behind other, you know, industrial developed countries? Well, you know, we're still trying to figure that out, but- it seems though um, in other countries, there's like an inverse relationship between uh, the use of doulas and midwives and um, out maternal outcomes. It appears though countries that utilize doulas and midwives tend to have better maternal outcomes. And we're still, you know, we're still wondering why that is. That's not might be part of it. And there are other, you know, there's always other parts of a, a big problem, but that's one thing that we've noticed um, is a, a, a big difference. You know, it's like an inverse relationship. If you look at a graph uh, between maternal deaths and a mat, uh, another graph of the use of midwives and doulas, it's an inverse relationship. So there's something going on on that end for sure. Okay, so for those in the, the audience, our listening audience who may not be familiar with a doula or maybe even the term doula, what is a doula? A doula, that's a good question. I, you know, I didn't know what one was for many years. You know, I was working, I was in the labor room one day. I, I was, you know, in a room with a patient and there was this, you know, young lady rubbing on her back and I'm like, you know, and talking to her, whispering in her ear and stuff. I'm like, and her husband was sitting there. I'm like, well, who was she? That's your sister, your cousin? Who was, who was this little woman who was all, you know, all in your business like that? And, and she said, that's my doula. And I didn't want to see me. I'm like, what's that? You know, I, I didn't even know what it was. I mean, honestly, and this, this was years and years ago, but, but still, I mean, people don't know unless you actually see one or have an interaction with one or have a family friend or somebody to interact with, you, you wouldn't know. But a doula is a, a, a non-medical support person. In other words, they're not doctors, they're not nurses, but they're a person, uh, somebody who has um, um, focused their education on maternal health and well-being. And they provide supportive services um, before, during, and after pregnancy, and, and and during delivery particularly. I mean, they they provide a lot of support. They focus a lot on breathing techniques, and um, um, you know, uh, focus your mind on uh, other things other than your pain. And you know, watching it's pretty amazing how effective um, uh, these people are with uh, laboring patients. So, so let me say this in terms of acknowledging to your point, you said you learned about doulas several, many, several years ago. And, and frankly, I think I only heard of doulas maybe about a year or so ago. And, and that's actually because, um, um, frankly, a friend of mine, um, and, um, and also she, she's my hairstylist. Is actually also a doula. <laughs> so, okay, good she, <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, she did her training and, you know, as she was going through her education and she was talking to me about it, you know, she's now, um, you know, completed her trainings and certified. So it, 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 and so I'm thinking again, and I'm, I'm, I'm a physician and just kind of recently hearing a, about doulas. So, how about we do this specifically give some specific examples of what a doula does. I know you said you talked about kind of the, you know, the, the, the rubbing and the massaging, but also helping them with breathing, helping them manage 
their 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 labor and their pain. What are some other sp- kind of specific things that they would do uh, be prior to labor and then also postpartum? Okay, what they do, they're they're um, they focus education on, on education. So um, it depends on when a mother opts to have a doula. She may have a doula just for delivery. Mm-hmm. She may opt to have a doula um, before she gets pregnant so she knows what to expect. So all along pregnancy, they, they will, you know, let a mother know, okay, um, you know, depending on the stage she is, okay, you should expect this during pregnancy. Now, you know, me as a doctor, I can tell her certain things, but, you know, we ha- we were like on a timeline. We have loads of patients in our in our waiting rooms and we have you know, X amount of time. And, you know, I spend a, a fair amount of time with my patients, but I, again, I still have a limited amount of time to go over, over every detail. So the doula education is more detailed and more customized to a, a, a person's needs. So it depends on, she may want her for right early pregnancy. She might want her for delivery, like I mentioned. She may want her in the second trimester. So it all depends on at what point uh, the mother feels she needs assistance. Now they found to be particularly useful um, in delivery, of course, and postpartum. Postpartum, uh, doulas can um, alert a mom when there's a complication, if she's having problems with breathing or pains or breastfeeding, um, a doula can assist with that. And doulas are particularly helpful when there um, are late complications of pregnancy, like um, a blood clot to the lung. There are certain symptoms that um, may persist. And if a woman has somebody she can just talk to on a regular basis, um, it's those um, negative outcomes can be averted. Sometimes people are not as quick to call the doctor because, well, I don't want to bother her. Um, she's busy or I'll be okay. Or, you know, things like that. Um, or, 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 or they don't recognize they're in trouble. Exactly. They, Do sometimes they, they, they don't recognize that, that that there's a problem and some mm-hmm. they don't recognize that that problem has progressed and they are deep doo-doo yep um and and in need of immediate attention and and, and a care. doula's right there a doula's right there to say girl i think you might need to call your doctor or i'm going to call your doctor for you or the nurse practitioner whoever you know call somebody for help a doula will help uh, a mother recognize that that there is a problem going on because they are educated in, in uh, recognizing these problems and, and getting the proper help for their for their patients. So now let me do this in terms of, um, one, I'm kind of going to go backwards actually to when they're in labor. One of the things that in, in my researching doulas, they talked about the fact about, because of course with the, the change in care in terms of how it's provided, that the nurses during labor used to be present a great deal of the, a great deal of time in order to offer support to the laboring patient but of course now that that has changed and so that support is not there the way it used to be and so therefore the doula's present excuse me presence again offers the mom the laboring mom support through the process that um, she no longer has actually from the from the hospital staff. Well, I think that varies between hospitals. Um, yeah, there's been staffing issues um, in recent years um, uh, because of the nursing shortage, and that might be the case. But you know, every hospital is different. Um, just overall, even when nurses there were more nurses around pre-COVID, things like that, the doula is, is was present before they got into the labor room, and it's somebody that the patient knows and always feels feels comfortable with. The nurse, she's just going to meet her. She doesn't really know her. That bond isn't really there. I mean, bonds are developed, re, you know, very rapidly because, you know, it's like you need help. It's like, oh, Becky, you, you can you gotta go home. You know, so so they there are, you know, you 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 know your people right away, but the doula is somebody who's um, a constant in their in their um their pregnant lives. And um I think they they provide support in a different way. I don't want to take anything from our nurses because the nurses provide a different type of support. And again, they do have other other patients, but the thing about doulas, there's already a relationship present when they come in, when they come in late. So I think that's a, a big difference. Agreed. And and of course, so let me let me let me say this. Um, you know, one of the the 
one of my most favorite people in the whole wide world is a nurse. Um, and so I, so I, I love nurses. Um, so I, I would never in any way suggest <laughs> or, you know, that, that the nurses are not providing the level or quality of care, uh, that, that they should. What I'm really just talking about, of course, is like all things, medicine has evolved and or changed yes. some, some of it. Some of it um, for the better, you know, just we talked about some of those basic things, you know, using sanitary procedures and processes, antibiotics, some other things. Uh, but there's also some things where I think it challenges it's the, how medicine has changed, is challenged the, the way we provide care and the connection to the patient, right? And yes. when you have, the fact, the fact of the matter is, especially with the demands of COVID, um, the pandemic and how it's affected things, the numbers of nurses, the, the stress upon nurses, and, and all staff for that matter. So it's, and medicine is more medically focused even before we got right to the pandemic. So I think the ways that some, some of the ways that nurses are able to provide care has been changed. So again, having that person, i.e. In, in this case, a doula there to help support you, to help kind of calm you, to ease your fears, to interact with staff on your behalf, to get questions answered, to get maybe certain kinds of care or treatment. Um, and while, as you already mentioned, doulas cannot make medical recommendations, right, about decision-making, mm -hmm. Um, you know, how, however, their approach, I think is also more patient and sometimes, Support. yes, yes. And, and so here's the other thing too, you know, you and I've had the, you and I've had the conversation previously where we talked about, you know, intervening, uh, in terms of the, in, ter in terms of the delivery process. And I, I don't know if you think that, and this I think would probably be an opportunity for us to kind of segue into the issue of, you know, maternal health and and mortality, i.e., you know, uh, illness and 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 death, because the fact of the matter is the research shows, and even our experiences show that amongst African American women or women of color that we experience that at a far higher level uh, or rate than Caucasian women. And, and it doesn't matter how much money you make, right? They're, they've had this, the, the two- As, two as Beyonce. Right, right. That's what I'm saying. We've had two instances fairly recently where, uh, you know, Beyonce, who's pregnant with twins, you know, almost died and- um, she either Same. had preeclampsia or, or eclampsia, but I think it had evolved maybe into eclampsia. And then of course, you know, S S Serena Williams, who almost died from a blood clot. So again, it goes beyond socioeconomic status. Yes. So wh why don't you address that for us? Okay. Um, again, maternal the maternal mortality in the United States far outpaces other wealthy countries. And it's for, um, well, I think all women, but particularly women of color. Mm -hmm. um, women of color, uh, particularly black women are three to four times more likely to die having a child than a white woman. Um, and, you know, they, they, you know, they wonder well, why is this happening? You know, even if you, um, um, if you, cover the social economics. Uh, like you said, it doesn't matter how much money you make, how much education you make, we still have this problem. It's like, well, why is that? And I mean, honestly, when my daughter had her, her baby last, well, I guess almost two years ago, in 2021, mm -hmm. I, was, I, was, I was petrified because I couldn't be there because it was still COVID restrictions. Okay. Um, and my, my daughter is educated and she's married and, um, well versed on prenatal care, the whole bit because of me, of course, but I couldn't be there. I couldn't be there to protect her. Right. And um, 
that was I was mortified. Anyway, that's another. I tell you, that's that was a great story. But um, the reason why this is 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 because it's thought to be from implicit bias. And what I mean from implicit bias is that it's um, things in your mind, in the back of your mind that you don't even know are there. So it might be, um, oh, black women always complaining or, you know, um, she's not paying into the system or, you know, uh, black women, they don't really need pain medicines. They, they can tolerate more pain than, than white women or other women, you know. Uh, you know, it's just things that may be in their minds that they don't even know are there. They're in their subconscious, and therefore, they might not offer pain medications as often, or they might not check on them as often, or you know, they get different treatments. So, overall. and so, and then let's let's just, um, you know, just also add in the, uh, the 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 also the the the, excuse me, the. Implicit balance, well, let me just say it like this. Also, there's a bias that um, some that some folks believe that we that frankly that that we're not human beings, right? That's that, right. That um, therefore, again, we don't experience pain in the same way exactly right that they do that we don't uh therefore as you already mentioned need pain meds we don't need or deserve the quality of of care and treatment that uh, a, a caucasian woman they feel is entitled to so those kind those those stereotypes and um and and really unfortunate beliefs lead to higher rates of death and illness for us i think across the board and um you know i think we're way way past the point of where we need to you know where we where we really need to as a society we we need to evolve right we, we way past yes. the point where as a society we need to evolve beyond those beliefs that um, if you're not white then you're not a human being right because you're subhuman that has to change correct correct so 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 to go back to what you were saying in general just about implicit implicit bias and how that impedes access to care um you you are you were saying well i'm just saying implicit bias sometimes um uh is a problem because it's like women of color oftentimes don't have the voice when they say i have a problem i i i don't feel anything i don't feel my feet or i can't breathe um i those complaints are not heard. And the result is um, sometimes fatal because if you don't, if somebody's telling you something's wrong and you don't hear it, you don't act on it, then that means they may get treatment later or ineffective treatment because if it wasn't, if it was taken care of earlier, it could have been more effective. Right. So, the, so, so here's the other thing too that, that happens. And one, just in general, women's um, complaints about being ill in general is dismissed. Absolutely. Uh, uh, again, you know, because we're also dealing with a profession that is largely that's patriarchal. Right? Yes. So just in general, regardless of what color you are or your socioeconomic status as a woman, your concerns, your complaints about not feeling well are subject to be attributed to it's all in your head. Dismissed. They're dismissed. Oh. Same thing with, with heart, heart attacks in women. Women die more of heart attacks because a lot of times they're... Um, their symptoms are, are not the usual symptoms that, that men have. Correct. And when they have complaints, they go they go un, um, unchecked. Mm -hmm. And 
by the time they come back, if they can get back, they're either near death or dead. So again, you're right. Women, are their complaints are dismissed. Uh, you would think that um, in an area where it's all about women, in, in an obese week, you would think that all women should be listened to equally, but that's not the case. So let me just let me just ask this obvious question, which is, do you know at this point about what the proportion of men to women, what the ratio is of men to women who are uh, ob guys? Any ideas? Oh, women for well, women are the majority now, and in uh, 2012. Um, women outnumbered men uh, by 51%. And so right now it's even more so. Okay, all right. Um, so the other thing too, that I was going to, as I always think of too, and is an example of, of this, this of, of women's you know, complaints being uh, ignored about their health and not feeling well, is Gilda Ratner. So, we, you know, this was, of course, was many years ago. You know, Gilda was famous, right? Yes. Well known for her skits on Saturday Night Live, you know, Rosanna Dana. And Gilda ended up dying of ovarian cancer. And the, the, and she had been seeking care, seeking treatment for an extended period of time. And her, her complaints were always dismissed. And so ovarian cancer, and you can talk about this, ovarian cancer is uh, usually takes, takes a long time to be diagnosed. And so by the time they found it, diagnosed it, of course it was terminal. So just again, using that as an example of how women's care we don't always get the care that 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 we need or deserve. Just using that as an example, what do you what do you, what do you, what are your thoughts on that? Well, my thoughts on ovarian cancer are a little different because ovarian cancer is very elusive. Okay, it's mm -hmm. a very elusive cancer. Um, sometimes you have no no signs or symptoms at all, or it might just be, oh, my stomach kind of hurts. Mm -hmm. Very vague symptoms, a lot, unless it's suspected. I can't remember her age, but I think she was kind of young. Usually, ovarian cancer comes a little later in life, um, and um, I'm not so sure. I don't remember her. I can't read. I don't know her. I didn't read her chart, so I don't know all the details about her case. But I can say that ovarian cancer is um, very difficult to diagnose unless it's suspected. You know, you may have a family history of of ovarian or uterine cancer. Uh, that might make it um, um, make you more suspicious, but it depends on the symptoms. The symptoms are very vague: um, belly aches, gas, um, constipation. It can be it can be different and very difficult to um, to to find. So I'm not really sure again who she talked to, what symptoms she reported, mm -hmm. but I can speak to the fact that ovarian cancer is difficult to diagnose overall. Yeah, so she was 42 uh, when she passed. Yeah, she was, so she was young. Yes. Yeah, she, she, she was, she was, de she was definitely young. So, 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 well, so let me ask you this then. So where does this leave us, <laughs> you know, at this point when it comes to, you know, women getting care and care that, um, is appropriate, that's life-saving, frankly, when you as a woman are, are you know, and again, we were, we were starting talking off about, you know, doing pregnancy and, and mm -hmm. you know, postpartum. And, and I think part of the thing too, that is an important part of the conversation is, you know, how women go, women getting, you know, care while they're pregnant, right? Mm -hmm. let, let, let's talk about that because that that's still an important part of improving the outcomes of the de of the delivery. Well, it all depends on where they live. You know, um, there's different reasons why people don't get care. Mm -hmm. And it's not just women of color. It depends on where you live. Um, rural women, you know, are often overlooked. And 
uh, the more Caucasian women that live in rural areas than mm -hmm. Black women, even though a lot of women of color do live in uh, rural areas, they're even worse off. But uh, geographical locations um, to, to getting um, um, care is a big, a big problem. And they're called healthcare deserts. And, but one out of three healthcare deserts actually are in urban areas. So they're not always in rural areas. So access to care, just being able to get somewhere is a big problem. And it's a problem that, that we're working on right now. So when you say access to care, kind of elaborate on that. Are we talking about this, 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 located. Yes, um, that's one. We, okay, we that's also one. talking about people in terms of their finances and transportation. And, exactly. We're talking about the fact that they have, if they have younger children, and having you know childcare yes. so that they can go to appointments. Let, let's talk, let's talk about that some. Yes, all those are are related to access to care. You know where where it's located. Do, do they have insurance? And insurance, I want to get up, get back to the postpartum care. Okay. Insurance has been a problem in the past. Why so many women have have died is because they didn't have access to care. Uh, traditionally, I'm, we're going to talk about Illinois. I know about Illinois because I've lived in Illinois, practiced in Illinois. Um, women have gotten postpartum care up to 60 days. Um, it has recently been extended to, you know, full 12 months instead of two months, 12 months, because there's um, things that happen late, later on uh, postpartum that need to be addressed that many women could not um, Addressed, I mean, we could not take care of because they did not have any insurance. They didn't have any uh, any way to get to a doctor. And if they got to a doctor, they had no money to pay for it. So Illinois is one of the one of the states that has actually extended their postpartum care to twelve months. And I think that the the the, um, um, the people of Illinois need to be um, commended for that for that change, a big change. So that was another problem. Women did not have access, don't have access to get prenatal care or postpartum care. And now that has been extended. So getting getting to the doctor, uh, having insurance, um, so, having so, uh, transportation. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm sorry, let me, let me just ask you for clarification. So when you say that Illinois has extended that, are we talking about Illinois Medicaid? What are we talking about? Yes, Isn't Illinois Medicaid. Yes. Okay. Illinois Medicaid has extended their coverage for, I'm sorry, I should have clarified. I'm sorry has extended their, their coverage for um, uh, their Medicaid population for 12 months, which I think is, is commendable. Yeah, I think that's fantastic actually. Um, and then, but, um, so what do, you, what do you think should or could be done in order to improve access to care, you know, during pregnancy? During, well, we have to um, develop more programs. First of all, we have to expand Medicaid, and we're doing that in Illinois, and some other states are doing it as well, but not enough. Um, expand uh, programs to assist women in getting uh, services, getting them to a provider. We have to increase our providers because, um, unfortunately, the OBGYN population is diminished. I mean, so we have yeah, so, to. So, so, so hold on for a second. And, and, you know, let's talk about that because it didn't just, this is not this did not just happen. I remember, no. and of course, I've been practicing for over 20 years, right? So you're talking about, and, and looks like I kind of lost you a little bit in terms of, there we go. Yeah. The, um, even when I was in residency, the cost of malpractice insurance was astronomical and and a, and you know and a deterrent for some folks in terms of their decision making to go into into ob -gyne. Yes. It is. It's ridiculous. And and you know that's the elephant in the room. You know, nobody talks about liability, malpractice. You know, can you find a provider? Uh, most OB providers are located in urban areas because you know you might have somebody who I have a friend that, well, one of my residents who practices out in uh, Ottawa, I don't know if he's still practicing or not, but he practices by himself. Nobody wants to live out there. You know, they want to be, they want to be in a city where they can get back up. So um, what do you, mean, you mean providers don't want to live out there? Yeah. ob guiding doctors. Okay. We don't want to, we don't want to live out there. I, okay. I, want, I like going to Bulls games and I like going to uh, plays and going on these nice restaurants. I love my lifestyle. 
I live in the city. And don't forget shopping, right? (laughs) We won't even miss that. (laughs) Yeah, I like it. Great food, great shopping, great entertainment, right? I'm guilty. I'm one of those. (laughs) Yes, yes. yes. You know, I, I, I like it and most people do. And so the, the rural areas are kind of left, um, left hanging. They, they don't have enough providers. So, and then it's, you know, the, our male practice is, is out of control. In Illinois, uh, some states have controlled it in other ways, but it's a problem for providers. So there's a provider shortage. And so, you know, so, let me, so, so to give a concrete number, how much are we talking about? How much is liability insurance for? You know, I don't know. I don't do that anymore. I, okay. I, I got out the business a, a while ago, but I can tell you what it was when I was practicing out in, in, in back in 2000, whenever that was 2016, it was over $150,000 a year just, just to work. Right. And so here's the other thing too, again, that I remember when, again, I'm in medical, in, you know, medical school and, you know, so we were talking about the nineties, the mm-hmm. early nineties, early to mid nineties. And I remember times having conversations, you know, with family or friends. And I, and I said, to, do you have any idea how much liability insurance costs? And they were like, no. And so back then I was like, it's $120,000 a year. I said, that's before you turn a light on, right? Mm-hmm. Before you've rented, you know, um, office space, before you paid staff, before you paid yourself, before you've done anything. That's right right? Before you bought equipment, before you've done anything, you already, you know, yeah. in debt for, uh, uh, obligated to $120,000 in order to work. Just to work. Just to work. So, and, and the folks that I talked to, of course, had no idea that, that there was that kind of expense involved. I said, so when you all are concerned about the cost of healthcare, one of the reasons why it's so costly is because of the, the liability insurance. And, and then, of course, when you add into, again, the various reasons why women may not get care during pregnancy, you add in things like, you know, and just being honest about it, substance abuse. Oh, my gosh. A big problem. Yeah. T- let's talk about that. We can talk about that. I'm glad that you, you brought that up because, you know, um, mental health is a big problem in uh, postpartum. Uh, people don't realize the amount of uh, postpartum depression and substance use um, and postpartum. In fact, uh, four out of five pregnancy related deaths um, in the U.S. Um, are preventable. And a lot of that prevention comes from the mental health um, side of um, postpartum care. You know, um, uh, women of color don't seem to be, they don't get screened at the same rates. And if they do get screened, the follow-up is uh, shoddy. You know, there's, there's no solid follow-up. And, and if there is follow-up, okay, what do they really do? I, I had a patient and she wasn't even a woman of color. She's a Caucasian woman who reached out to me. She felt, she felt she was going to hurt her baby and mm-hmm. herself. And I sent her to, um, uh, a facility that, you know, said that they were uh, specialized in that. They saw her in the emergency room and then they sent her home. And then I got a call from her husband that the baby was being airlifted to uh, Indianapolis because she was from Indiana. And um, I never got any follow behind that because I kind of didn't even want to know because I knew what happened. He said he let he rolled over on the baby, but we know that's not what happened. Um, so it's all about getting... Um, health care and the, the mental health care in the right time and having proper follow-up and who they're going to follow. So we need to develop more programs to follow our, um, our all our women, not just women of color, all our women um, during this time is very, very uh, high-risk time for women. Um, and substance use order disorders, actually, uh, many of these postpartum um, deaths Mm-hmm. are related to postpartum uh, depression and substance use. So when we talk about substance use in this case, what kind of substances are we talking about? Hmm. Um, you these opioids, opioid disorder. Those seem to be the, the problem. Okay. okay. You know, and, then, so, and, then, and so, so are we talking about uh, in terms of maternal death? Are we talking about 
infant death? We're we talking about both. What are we What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about maternal maternal deaths right now, and you know, uh, more than you know, half of all pregnancy related deaths happen, um, you know, after after that that six weeks uh, that six week, that six week checkup. So we need to watch our women. Uh, we need to uh, have more mental health uh, programs available for them. Um, um, and hopefully we, we will bring this out in this conversation and, and let people, you know, education is key. Um, so, you know, so one of the things when you say education is key, for me, mm -hmm. what I think one of the basic fundamental understanding that's missing in general with medicine is, and this is where I try to say it to people, <laughs> your body can't live without a brain. <laughs> you need a brain. Well, most right. of us do. <laughs> right. You know, I, you know, whether you, whether you believe that you're a human being or whether you believe that you're a spiritual being, you need hands and feet in order to live out your infinite potential to demonstrate your inherent wonderfulness. Right. You, and, and, and in order to have those hands and feet working, you need a brain to operate them. So I think kind of basic, that basic fundamental truth seems to be missing from uh, our conceptualization of how we provide care. And what I mean by that is, it doesn't matter if you're an ob you know, or if you're in family practice or for peds, or if you're in surgery or oncology, it doesn't matter what the specialty, medical specialty is that you are practicing, that you're dealing with a person who has a brain that has to run everything except some basic simple reflexes. And so if that brain is not working properly, guess what that means? That means either you're gonna have glitches in what, how you think, what you think, how you feel, what you do, how your brain functions and operates. And so then when you look at also that that basic truth to me doesn't seem to be a basic fundamental tenant uh, uh, or inclusion of how we treat patients, how we care for patients, that then we're not looking at what does the brain need in order to be healthy? You know, for me, I look at I tell people in order to have a good or great product, you have to have two things. You have to have quality raw materials and you have to have qual quality workmanship. And if not, either one of those are missing, you still have to get an average or substandard product. Right. Specifically, I'm, in this case, I'm talking about your brain. So it's right. So one of the things that we don't, do well because it's not part of our training is nutrition, right? Nutrition, the, the nutrients, vitamins, minerals, proteins, amino acids, all of that stuff that our brain needs to function with blood flow that our brain needs to function well. That's an important part of the conversation that's missing even in primary care. Um, you know, vitamin D, as, as, as you well know, vitamin D it's hugely important. Mm -hmm. And 70% of people that live north of Atlanta, that that level drops off um, by the time you hit to March, which of course is peak time for the flu. But it also, it's 70% it's of people since they live north of Atlanta are deficient. Number one, vitamin D does a number of things. It's, it's important to have in a strong immune system, right? So when we're talking about COVID or any other viruses or anything else, any other invaders, mm -hmm. including cancer cells, the yes. vitamin D is important. But vitamin D is also important in things like chronic pain, depression, anxiety, right? So all the things like magnesium, selenium, chromium, zinc, iron, B12, folate, all of those are critically important in your brain health in, in preventing depression and anxiety. So those are, so when we start talking about even in terms of maternal health postpartum, to me, that's that's an important element, that's an essential element, brain health that's that's missing from our care. As, You're right. As, yeah. You're right, doctor. And I'm gonna I'm glad you brought that up because in in 
the, the black community in particular, it seems there's stigma associated with, with um, mental, when you, when you have mental health issues or you want to get mental health. And I think the stigma is what keeps a lot of people from seeking mental health, even if they feel like they may need help, the stigma associated with it. So we need to work on that in our communities and get it out there. Just like you said, if your head is not right, nothing's, nothing's right. Just like you mentioned, okay, we got, we're talking about mothers. If mama's not right, nobody's right. So if mama's not right, she's not getting the proper mental health, this is gonna affect her baby. And this will affect the next generation and the next generation. So it's super important that we get mental health going on in the black community in general, but particularly for our mothers because we need to get these babies off to a good start. And good babies need good mamas. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, so here's, so here's the thing. And we kind of talk about that with regard to some things, but we know, for instance, like they'll talk about, make sure you take calcium because the baby is pulling and will pull that from your bones as the mother, if you're not getting enough calcium, but, and the, but the same thing is true with the rest of vitamins and minerals. And so we see these, again, these instances of postpartum depression, which of course can be an indicator that the mom actually may have bipolar, may have bipolar affective disorder. Postpartum depression is, is, a, is, a, is a risk factor for having bipolar affective disorder. And so then that needs, that needs to be assessed. But also again, the baby is pulling these nutrients from the mom. And so if she's not getting a, an, these adequate, an adequate supply of these minerals, Again, that can also cause a drop off, a drop off in depression. Also, to your point about the quality of of mothering, how are you going to mother well if you depressed, right? And you know what I I will share with people is uh, as again I've had bouts of depression off and on, and I remember after and actually since high school. But I remember after having my son, who is, is now 17, I remember basically what I was doing and my, and my husband was on, went on active duty like seven months after he was born. So I had little, really little, no support either. And I was basically kind of keep what I call keeping the wheels on the cart, right? I was, I was taking care of him. Um, make sure he was loved, make sure he was fed and, and changed and nurtured and that kind of thing. And I was going to work, but there were a lot of other things that, you know, and, 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 and other things that are important to do in terms of my adult responsibilities th that I, I, I couldn't necessarily get to, you know, so it's, it's um, and, and the studies are out there. So let me just say this too. The studies are out there and have been out there. When you have like, and, and I'm talking about, I'm talking about like more than 20 years ago that they you know, they did this study where you had um, like, like they had, a, it was a monkey basically. And so how did the monkey develop based upon the interaction it got with some kind of mom figure? So first there was obviously, there was no mother figure. Then there was a wire figure. Then there was a wire figure, you know, wrapped in some kind of soft cloth. And, and basically what they found was the less of the figure it had, so it went from the, the wired figure with the soft cloth down to the one with, with nothing, the more aberrant was the behavior of the monkey by the time they got to no mother figure. Because, because of course there's no nurturing, right? Mm -hmm. There's no guidance, there's no comforting, there's right. no nothing there. So the development uh, of, the, of, of that, you know, child monkey, the little, the, the, the monkey, smaller monkey, the baby. It's, just, it's, it's a baby monkey. It's just aberrant. It's abnormal. Mm -hmm. So, 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 you know, I said that again, to support your point that, you know, we have to have healthy moms and we have to have healthy parents in order to have uh, children developing in a healthy way. Right. It, it, it's just like, you know, common sense. Although one of my attendings, he was a chief of radiology at, at uh, the West, it was Westside VA then, Dr. Espinoza, and he would say, common sense, the least common of all senses. Right? <laughs> you know, this yes. is, you know, you, you, this ain't rocket science, right? That we should be able to, to know and understand these things. 
So but being a mother is overwhelming anyway. I mean, being a mother myself and, you know, I had support, even if you have support, it's overwhelming. You know, all of a sudden you're, you're somebody's mama. I remember getting up, you know, my first daughter, I, I, I got up, I was going to go to the store. I, I said, I needed, I needed some toilet paper or something I needed. I just got up and was like, get ready. I put my hand on the, I'm like, I can't go anywhere. I got a baby. I got, I got to, I have to get her dressed. I have to feed her. I decided not to go, but it's a whole, <laughs> I'm like, I'm not going. but it's a whole adjustment of who you are. You go from a regular person to somebody's mother. That whole concept is overwhelming. And depending on where you are with your nutrients and your baseline mental health, it can send you over one way or the other. You know, do you, do you have a mother? Do you have sister? Do you have friends? Do you have a husband or a partner that will, you know, give you a break? Some people don't get a break, you know? Agreed. And everybody talks, everybody talks about the first mom, the first baby. I think we need to put more emphasis on the second and third babies because the first baby, you can go lay down if you're tired. The second baby, you got somebody that needs to be fed and needs to be, you know, taken care of. You can't lay down. And so we need to address maternal health, I think, maybe in a different way, you know, going forward to make sure all women get what they need. To make so, us and I was going to say, and to your point, there was a, it was actually a study that was on marriage that came, that came out recently. And the, the name of the study escapes me. But again, it was a study of marriage. But one of the things they looked at, again, was how having children in childcare, you know, impacted the marriage. And so one of the things that they discovered was on average, it took about 33 hours a week to take care of, of an infant and to take care of a child. And I was like, oh my God. I said, see, this is the kind of information, that kind of concrete, specific information mm -hmm. that we need to get out there because th that's, there are a lot of jobs that 30 hours a week is full time. Yeah. With, with benefits. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, know, you, know what I'm, you know what I'm saying? So if you, now you got basically another full-time job on top of taking care of you on top of, you know, if you are a working parent and then, so you potentially now have what, especially if you're a single three parent, jobs. three jobs, three full-time jobs. How are you supposed to do that and then not end up stressed, not end up necessarily depressed or, or anxious? And frankly, frankly, then I can see why, how, while it's not right uh, for a child to be abused, it's never right, it's never okay, but I can see how that can easily happen in that, in that circumstances, yes. in those instances where you have three full-time jobs and little or no support. And then, of course, there's always the other elephant in the room is that because of the tra more traditional um, ways that roles and responsibilities are broken out, that, you know, how much mm -hmm. is your partner, even if you are married or even if you are living together, if you have a significant other, how much are they actually participating, you know, in the care of this child? So you know, I just, you know, again, wanted to kind of take it back to what you were saying again about then again, problems with depression and problems with anxiety. And then of course, also, you know, also substance abuse, right? So whether that is opiates, whether including pain pills, including heroin, including benzos, you know, so we're talking about prescribed medicine, benzos, marijuana, of course, now, of course, and marijuana is legal, but it still doesn't you know, it still doesn't mean that it can't be overused. It's like and, alcohol. You know, right. And I said, so, you know, some, some of my, some, some people, some people, even some of my patients go, so it's not a drug. I, so I didn't think I needed to mention it when you asked me about drugs and I'm going, is, is alcohol legal? Right. <laughs> yes. Alcohol that. is legal. It's still a drug. So being legal is not a determinant if something is a drug or not. And certainly not if it's, you know, if it's, if it's overused. So for me as a psychiatrist, to me, it's far more about, we need to make programs available. We, we, yes. we need to do, we, we need to one have, and, and I'm going to say this, how do we have health programs in schools and don't talk about brain health? Are you, are you, are you serious? How do we, how do we? How? Stigma. It's stigma. 
but but you but we're but we're stigmatizing the very thing that we need. It's 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 like and I, and I'm going to use something simple. It's like stigmatizing the soap. You know, I want to use, <laughs> use I want to use body wash, but I don't want to use bar soap. You know what? You need some soap, so, <laughs> right? You need some soap. So the, the there's this whole disconnect of what really matters. We need a brain. Like I said, your body can't live without a brain. We need a brain to operate our bodies. So what we're stigmatizing the very thing that we need in order to live, in order to do anything, in order to, in order to dream, in order to fulfill purpose. And so, and we've made it about who we are, what it says about me, you know, that person's weak or they're, um, um, you know, or they're inadequate or, and obviously it's, you know, the, the whole thing about people are crazy. crazy. And, and I, and I tell people, there's a difference between what I call cray cray, which is dysfunctional behavior versus mentally ill. The brain is an organ, just like your heart, your liver, your lungs, your kidney, and it can become ill just like any other organ or tissue in your body. So why don't we treat it that way as opposed to making it personal about about the uh, 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 in terms of it's some character issue or it says something about the mm. person. Now, clearly, what happens is it can show up in your behavior, right? In that you you know, and I think really what it comes down to is people are afraid that they're going to end up being the person who's pushing the shopping cart or the bag lady, you know, down the street, homeless, and talking to themselves and and acting strange or weird. And so, if if something's going on with me. And then what if they tell me that? Or what if I have to take the medicine? What if I'm always telling me making medicine? And I think the side effects are worse, you know, worse than the, the medication itself and worse than the benefits. You know, just, uh, you know, and a lot of folks sometimes don't disagree. They don't agree with the diagnosis. So I, I think they're, they're all of those issues. But again, to, you know, to bring that back around to, you know, mental health and maternal health and morbidity I think it needs to be a fundamental part of the care that we provide on, on, on all levels and certainly even mm -hmm. primary care, whether it's family practice, you know, whether it's ob gyne whether it's whatever internal medicine, um, especially because those are the, usually the doorways, the entry um, in terms of, so, so what are you just, what are your, well, I know I had a lot of to say about that, but you know, I'm I, because my because I think medicine itself also needs to involve evolve. Excuse me. So, just what are your thoughts about that in terms of its incorporation for for better, you know, maternal outcomes? I think it's. I think you're right on point. In fact, when I was in private practice, I spent. I think I spent more time doing your job than my ob job. You know, people needed to talk. They needed to talk things out. And, um, you know, people complained about the weight when they, when they got to me, they just poured it all out, you know, and I, I assisted them, you know, they just need somebody to talk to that they felt safe to talk to. I was a safe space for them. But unfortunately, times have changed. And, you know, ob are in short supply. We have to get people in and out. So we don't have that time. So we're going to have to try to incorporate uh, mental health in our prenatal programs some kind of way. Now, you know, we're talking all this, there's limited funds, there's limited time, but, you know, um, we have to make time for mental health. And I think we haven't in years. And I think now we're seeing the, the end result. I think 30 years ago or something like that, they closed down a lot of the mental health facilities, at least in Illinois. And now we're having a lot of problems and they, they're wondering why things are the way they are. And I think a lot of, a lot of reason why they are the way they are is because of what we've been doing with mental health, which is ignoring it. And I think we need to incorporate it um, definitely in our prenatal uh, programs some kind of way. Well, you know, the other thing too I say to people is think of your brain like air traffic control. So when air traffic yeah. control goes down, and we just had something recently in the last, within the last few weeks, where mm -hmm. then you had what, more than 3,500 planes right. That were grounded, right? Right. We had other planes that had to be diverted, you know, heaven forbid, and this didn't happen with this la this most recent occurrence. But again, I'm talking about thinking about it if air traffic control is not working. 
you potentially got planes circling and potentially <laughs> running out of gas or they got to make emergency crashes. You got planes crashing into each other. You got, again, uh, planes that are grounded, can't get off the air, can't get out, they're grounded, cannot get into the air. And we really need to think about our brain in very practical terms, such as those, which is in, in that therefore it's essential, brain health is essential in our abilities to live, to function, to have relationships, again, to fulfill dreams and purposes, to care for our children and enable for them to be well-developed, nurtured, loved, and, 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 to be their, and to be their best selves. So, you know, again, to bring this back to what we started off talking about is, is while doulas, again, are not, they're not medical professionals, that I think sense of support and well-being, even in the prenatal period that, that they offer, um, clearly why we don't necessarily know the reasons why, but we know even just supportive therapy and we know that placebos, which is the belief that this is going to help me, has a significant impact upon how well people do, right? So having somebody to listen to you, having somebody to help you formulate opinions and formulate solutions and um, and have better outcomes. Would you, would you agree? Well, well, sort of. I mean, that's part of it, you know, in the long term, the long run, but during labor and delivery and, and, his, and let me and i'm sorry let me say we're gonna, have, we're gonna have to go ahead and wrap up i, I know we're we're we are loving this conversation well i'm looking it's, i'm looking i'm watching the time but i'm just gonna say real quick that in labor and delivery they they provide more focused care for them and allow them not to um there are less interventions and when they say interventions we mean c-sections mm -hmm. and uh operative deliveries like forceps things like that and so there's less blood loss less chance for repeat C-sections and more, the morbidity and mortality that comes along with that. Uh, so I'll, I'll just, I'll just stop right there. Yeah. So, it's, so it sounds like that you would highly recommend uh, uh, including doulas in the, in the prenatal care during the pregnancy and postpartum. And, and, am I hearing that right, Dr. Perry? If possible, somebody who has more time to spend and answer questions, focus questions, because a lot of times OB, OB-GYNs are not available and don't have the time that they would like to share with patients. Times have changed. So doulas will be a welcome uh, addition to the prenatal program. So, you know what, we, we, we're going to push the pause button and, and, and I'm sure that we th there will be another opportunity for us to, to continue this really important conversation. And I want to say thank you so much, Dr. Donna Perry, the medical director of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois for, in, for joining me today and having this conversation and, you know, imparting your, your wisdom and your knowledge and your experience to myself and, and to my listeners. And so with that, um, I will say that I am Dr. Balan A. Durr, awakening and empowering you to live out your infinite potential, to live life in the sweet spot. And I want to make sure that you stay tuned, that you like us, follow us, share on social media. And again, stay tuned for these thought-provoking, sometimes mind-blowing conversations that awaken and empower you to live in the sweet spot. I'll see you next time. Thank you for joining us today in the sweet spot. Share, follow, and like us on social media. To learn more, please visit balinadurmd.com, spelled B A L I N A D U R R M D.com. Join us next week, and remember when you heal your mind, all things are possible. Thank you.